Who should the Minnesota Vikings pursue in free agency? They have a lot of questions to answer and all starts at quarterback, but I would expect that answer to come pretty quickly, whether it be the Vikings resign Kirk cousins, pursue another veteran option like a Baker Mayfield or trade up before the draft so they can ensure themselves one of those top four quarterbacks. So we're not going to look at quarterbacks here today. We are going to look at free agents on both sides of the football. And let's just be real. The defense dominates. They shouldn't go for all of these guys, but they should at least inquire about all of them and then try to figure out what works best under the salary cap. So I have 12 names that the Vikings should look to bring in. We're going to discuss all of them here on the real Forno show. by Tyler Fornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire, writer for the College Football Network, publisher of Substack Run in Shooter, host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Skull. I guess. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Real Forno Show. I'm your host, Tyler Forno. With me, as always, in the top right corner is producer Dave. We have a lot of free agents to talk about. And as I kind of said at the top, the Vikings should not sign all of these players. But what they should do is inquire about all of them. And then within the context of those discussions, try to figure out how to piece together a much improved roster. So we're going to look at 10 players on defense and two on offense and the two on offense might not be players. You were necessarily considering early on, but we are going to have those conversations. We're going to kind of dive into why each of them fit. And I think that's going to be a really interesting conversation. And let's just be real. You're not going to agree with all of them and that's okay. Uh, If you have any uh, other free agents that you are interested in, go ahead and throw them in the comments, either, after the live show or during the live show, we may touch on a few of them at the end. So let's just get right to it, Dave. Uh, There are a lot of interesting players. And I think the one that we have to start off with, and if you want a, a written companion piece, I do have one on Vikings wire, 12 players, the Vikings should pursue in free agency that you can just go click on. You can have that right in front of you. So the first one on the list Uh, We're not going to beat around the bush. It's Miami defensive tackle Christian Wilkins. And you're going to see a few Miami players on here. Why? They're good. And there's a connection with Brian Flores. Both of those things matter. Wilkins was the first player that Brian Flores ever drafted. And he has been fantastic as a three technique. And in this defense, he would kind of move between three technique, five technique, maybe even play a little one technique on pass rush downs, a similar role to what Harrison Phillips has been playing. The big difference between Wilkins and Phillips is it'd be a significant upgrade to get Christian Wilkins in. And that's not an insult to Harrison Phillips. He's a very good football player. Christian Wilkins is a borderline great football player and his contract projection per PFF, which is what all of my contract projections that I used for the piece are from Four years, $100 million. It's $25 million a year. Now, you can kind of maneuver some of that money and make the cap a little less now, but you're going to have to pay the piper eventually. And I think you can argue that Wilkins on a four-year deal would be a smart play because he is 28 years old, so he's a little bit older for a first-time free agent, which which is okay. And he's going to be 32 when that contract is done. And when that contract is done... The salary cap could very well be $350 million. So a 25 to $30 million cap hit for the final season. That doesn't look too bad in comparison because a 25 to $30 million cap hit five years ago when the cap was under 200 million borderline debilitating. But that's why a lot of these contracts start out small and escalate because they know the cap is rising. And with how these media deals have been impacted for uh, the, how much the salary cap is because the players get a cut of that. And the way I did a rough calculation, I thought there would be an extra $7.5 million in cap space just from media deals. Because you take how much that the NFLPA was getting 
you split it equally among 32 teams and that all goes to players. There we go. So let's, uh, Hey Dean, you're able to live comment this time. All right. Dean was having some issues live commenting. So it's good to see that those kind of got those kinks got worked out. So why Wilkins? Well, he's a prototypical three technique and in the way Brian Flores would likes to use his defense, you can do a lot of different things with that. So three technique usually has his inside shoulder over the guards outside shoulder. So if they're lined up over left guard, left shoulder over left shoulder. All right. And then a four eye is just sliding over half a gap. So it's right shoulder over the tackles, right shoulder. When you're on that side, you're the outside shoulder to the inside shoulder. Okay. They're filling All that the B gap, basically. Yep. yep. Fill in the B gap. So you can do a lot of different things. You can slide him to just a five technique, which is just lining up straight over the tackle. You're looking him dead in the eyes. You can put him more on the interior during pass rush downs, because then you're going to have a lot of different looks. The Vikings love to use those three edge rusher looks last year. And depending on how the edge room looks this year could have a lot of different factors in it. And I think Wilkins would be a fantastic player. Plus he played 968 snaps on the interior last year. That's a lot. I, I think the Vikings would probably want to bring that down to around 800. And he did have 61 pressures and 10 sacks on the interior, which are both very good numbers. If you can get 50 pressures on the interior, you're having a damn good season, but this is a, a little bit better than that. And I'm very intrigued by him. I think you can utilize him in a bunch of different ways. And especially if you bring Daniel Hunter back, I think they could be a really nice tandem to start off with. Wilkins can also play the run. So not only are you getting a good pass rusher, but you're getting a solid run defender. Look, it's expensive, but you have to pay for good football players. And there's some guys that you just have to fork over money for some guys. You shouldn't. And I think we saw that with free agency last year, we were projecting guys like Jacoby Myers and Juju Smith Schuster to get 16, 17 million a year. They got 11 and the market has kind of settled down on some of those guys, but sometimes you just have to pay and free agency is where you fix problems. And right now the Vikings have a defensive line problem. Wilkins can be a big step in fixing it and making you a little bit more comfortable going into the NFL draft, which is what free agency is for. Now that we have Wilkins out of the way, let's move over to another Miami defensive lineman. That is Emmanuel Ogba. He's more of a five technique defensive end, but he's a, he's a pretty good player. And it's interesting. I haven't looked at his injury history, but he only played 286 and 326 snaps over the last two years. That's not a lot, Dave. That is a significant, like that's a rotational guy. But with Brian Flores, the two years he was with Miami, over 750 snaps in both years. So did they just not want to use him in those two years? I think he was injured in 2022. And then 2023 was like Fangio. And I don't think Fangio was a big fan of him. So Agba, 6'4", 278. He's got 35 and a half inch arms. So you can do a lot of things with reach, and stack and shed and be able to get into the the chest of an offensive lineman a lot easier. And then by proxy, you can do a lot of things to be able to get into the backfield. So I like the idea of Agba. He is 30 and it's probably going to be like, Oh, maybe a two or three year deal worth about five or $6 million a year. He wasn't a traditional free agent. He was released. So that means two things. One, he does not count at all towards the compensatory pick formula, which is big. The Vikings have a chance to get two third round picks, Kirk cousins and Daniel Hunter. If they both leave, but you have to not have those free agents uh, signed. So they cancel out. That's how that works. You sign Agba. He doesn't count towards that formula. So you get a free agent in and you don't have to worry about that. You can still get that comp pick. I don't know what comp picks mean to Quasi Dolphamensa. He has not really tried to get comp picks in his two years. He has instead preferred to play the market. Will he change his mind with this free agency period? I don't know, but it, it'll be interesting to see how he approaches that. And Agba wouldn't count and provide a friendly face for Brian Flores and a talented player that can do a few different things. I'd if, rather have good players than the comp picks. 
if, well, if they can. You might be able to do both. That's the interesting thing. Because there are enough players to get cut where you could do both. It just depends on how you want to structure it. The Baltimore Ravens have been doing this for years. And then they use those comp picks on guys like Matt Judon, Justin Matabuike. And then they just become big time free agents over the course of four years. Zadarius Smith. They use these late round picks on defensive linemen and pass rushers, and then they develop them and they become really good football players. So there is a really good method to that. There's a lot of ide- ideological positives to that. Plus, if you get a fifth round pick, you develop them and then he signs a big deal somewhere else. Guess what? You can get a third round comp pick from a fifth round pick. That's pretty good value. And that those are the kind of things that you have to kind of weigh versus only attacking the good players because in free agency, you need to find value. That's a big thing. So all those things matter. And Agba would provide a little bit of both, but there's one more Miami Dolphin. We have to talk about <sighs> linebacker, Jerome Baker. Now linebacker is a very interesting position right now. It's not viewed as a premium position, but I think it's trending that way. And let me kind of explain why. You look at the top four teams this past year, the Ravens, the Lions, the Niners, the Chiefs. What do they all have in common other than making the championship round? They all have really good second level players. Patrick Queen and Roquan Smith for the Ravens, uh, Jack Campbell and Alex Anzalone for the Lions, Fred Warner and Drake Greenlaw for the 49ers. And Nick Bolton, Leo Chanel, Drew Tranquil, and Willie Gay for the Chiefs. If you have good second-level players that can allow you to be so much more multiple, it can allow you to attack in base coverages much, much better, and you can do more things without having to feel constricted by having a like a Jordan Hicks on the field who you might not feel comfortable in pass coverage, but you feel really good about him as a run defender. That matters. Having those kind of players matters especially in today's NFL when so much is positionless. And I think that adding a guy like Baker could be really interesting. He's only 27 years old. He's much better in coverage than he is in run defense. But I think if you put a, um, and I don't think he was necessarily a great fit for that Vic Fangio scheme because the Vic Fangio scheme, it's basically, we're going to allow you to kind of run the football a little bit and we're going to allow you to, get all these dinks and dunks. We're not going to let you take us over the top. If you want to beat us, beat us with paper cuts. Well, the, it ugh, it's not set up to be really good against the run. You got to have dudes and Miami had a couple dudes, but sometimes it's not enough to be consistent. And I think with the Vikings style now, I think Baker might be able to slide in and be a better fit like Ogba. Baker was released, so he does not count towards the compensatory pick formula. That is big. Like, that all matters. And I don't know how intentional Quasi is going to be with that, but it's something that we're going to mention until we know for sure because it all adds up to good strategy. I bet he does think about it. Oh, I know he thinks about it. I just don't know how much he cares about it because we haven't seen him show that it matters. But we are also only two years in, and he spent those first two years shedding some ugly contracts. So all those things have to play in together. Let's get into some more big round belly beef, Dave. Yeah, but before that, I want to agree with Mateo the potato. We're about to be the Dolphins North. Good choices, though. Unlike getting Packers sloppy seconds. You got that right, Mateo. I don't know if we'll end up being Dolphins North, but... There's a reason why there's a link, Brian Flores. So we'll kind of find out over time. But DJ Reader, DJ DJ Reader is a very interesting player. So when the Bengals signed him for big money three years ago, I think it was three years, 45 million. I was like, wow, they're giving a nose tackle a lot of money. Well, he was one of the linchpins to their Super Bowl run. And when you have a really good nose tackle, it can allow you to do a lot of things, especially with that second level, especially with your pass rush. And in the run game, he's so dominant. Unfortunately, he also suffered the same injury that DJ Wanham did, a torn quadricep tendon. He suffered that against the Minnesota Vikings. And he's 30 years old. So that could be a really rough way to end his career. I don't know if it's career ending. I'm not even going to speculate that is. But when you're that big, that's a brutal injury to come back from. 
So will it impact him? I don't know. But if he comes back and he's just the same player, what a tremendous asset this would be because he can handle double teams. He can get penetration through those double teams. He can win with quickness. He can win with brute strength. He's got great size and that can massively impact how you play football. It can massively impact so many different things about your game as a defense. So when we have yeah, Alex Peters on, can we ask him about a pulled quad? I can ask him if he knows about it. Yeah. Okay. I'd appreciate that because I've heard different things. I've heard it's ah, it's nothing, just pulled muscle, and I've heard oh, it could be career well, threatening. So this isn't a quad; it's a quad tendon. So this okay. is what specifically like uh, attaches to the. I think this is what attaches to the bone, like the muscle is too. But this like. Uh, like it could have pulled it, off from the bone and now they've got to attach it. It's like tearing a knee ligament. It's just a tad bit higher. So it is a big deal, but reader is a fantastic football player and he could have a similar impact to what Linval Joseph had. And I'm not saying they're identical. I'm not saying he's as good. I would argue he is as good as what Linval was when we signed him and how good Linval was for like that three, four year stretch. Linval was a beast. Let mm-hmm. him eat. Having, Maybe let him eat having that quick nose tackle can make all the difference in the world for what you want to do on defense. So getting him could be a really, really interesting one. Raekwon Davis from Miami is a guy I consider too. I think he's probably like the discount option. He's like, he's only really a run defender, but he's got 35 and a half inch arms, like 310 pounds. He's a very interesting player. I'm not going to say he's a great player, but could be for a discount. Let's kind of move in to a, another player. We're going to, we're going to spend some time in the Pacific Northwest Seattle Seahawks inside linebacker, Jordan Brooks. People kind of laughed at him being a first round pick a few years ago, 2020, because it was thought that he was going to be a, uh, like a third round kind of guy, but he rewarded the Seahawks. He played pretty well. He did deal with some injuries, which is one of the reasons why they didn't use the fifth year option on him. But once he, when he was on the field, he was pretty good. And, Interestingly enough, his highest PFF grade by far pass rush, Dave, in blitzes as an off ball linebacker. You know, Brian Flores loves to utilize those kind of guys. 43 snaps, pass rushing, 13 pressures, and six sacks. That's a, it's a very small sample size, but it is a significant, significant win rate. That's like, that's nearly a 30% win rate. That's incredible for a linebacker. Now it is a small sample size. And when you have something like this, the more pass rush reps you give him, the less effective he will be per snap, but you can get a positive outcome. Even if he gets to down to a 20% pass rush win, win rate and gets pressures and sacks, I think that's a massive benefit on that second level. He has decent cover skills and he's a, a pretty good athlete. And I think he'd be really good in trying to stop the run. But having that pass rush element really fascinates me and how he would translate to Brian Flores' defense with how multiple he likes to be, how he likes to send those zero blitzes and being able to manipulate inside uh, off interior offensive linemen to really be able to get home. I like the idea of Jordan Brooks, but projected three years, $36 million. How does it compare to uh, our young stud at linebacker, Ivan Pace Jr., when it comes to pass rushes? Well, I'll I'll tell you this. Brooks is a more complete linebacker. I I wouldn't, I think Ivan Pace, for lack of a better term, is more of a pass rush specialist. I still don't think he's a complete linebacker. And he played really well and he deserves all the credit in the world for it. But long term, I don't think he's your starting middle linebacker. I think you have to find that guy and you need to use Ivan Pace sporadically, situationally, so you can make the best use out of him. That was my my theory on, on him coming out of the NFL draft. And after last season, I think he played better than I anticipated in some of those areas, but he's still limited. And that like, that's okay. He's a UDFA that was incredibly successful and arguably should have had votes for rookie of the year, but it's, it's okay that he is not a well-rounded full player. He's just, he's good at what he's good at. And I think that's objectively great but we shouldn't expect him to be this all world middle linebacker. And if he becomes that, that's awesome. But I don't think he's going to be. And I think the, we just have to be okay 
accepting limitations from guys and acknowledging, hey, we're going to use him in this way, but we're not going to be using him every other way. Like, I, I, it's, it's not blasphemy, Anthony. It's, it's just being real. He played way better than expectations and better than what his, his skill set is. Like, that's great. But predi- predicting year over year success when you don't have that kind of like ability in your skill set to do that, I think it's very difficult to do. And if he yeah, does, he that's awesome. I mean, he only had well, his first year. Y- yes and no. He doesn't move laterally well at all. And that's, that's his biggest issue. He, he's a good tackler uh, shooting downhill into the gaps. He's really good at rushing the passer and evading blockers because of, of his athleticism and size. He uses size to his advantage because he can like dip under blocks and he can, he, he can be really shifty in how he like gets through holes. And he does a good job of reading, uh, reading gaps as far as what, what the running back is going to come through. But it's his ability to cover and his ability to go sideline to sideline is just not up to par for what you need from a starting middle linebacker. And that's okay. Like he was undrafted. I had him as a, a fourth round player, but he's just overall limited. And, and it's okay to admit that it's not saying he's bad. He played very well last year and he should play very well moving forward. But understanding the limitations is a really big thing for how you project players out. And I just don't see him as a tr- traditional starter long-term and that that's okay. I just all hope right. he develops more. That's all. I think he will. I just, with his lack of ability to move laterally, I just think it's important to remember that. That's all. Well, I hope he develops that, that he works on it all summer. Moving sideways. All right. Let's move on to the next Seattle Seahawk on the list. This is going to be a weird one. Tight end Noah Fant. Now, if you remember the name Noah Fant, he was teammates with TJ Hawkinson at Iowa, and they both came out in that 2019 NFL draft. Hawkinson got picked eighth by the Lions. Fant got picked 20th by the Denver Broncos, and he was a part of the Russell Wilson trade. Fant is a very good football player, but I don't think that we need to sign him to a long-term deal. I think this is a one-year rental. I think give him a one-year deal. Uh, PFF has him with a three-year, $24 million contract. So you might have to give him like nine or $10 million. But here's, here's the thing. TJ Hawkinson probably isn't going to play until at earliest Halloween. And even then I'm, I'm pretty, I'm going to guess that he doesn't play until after Thanksgiving because he had surgery on the 24th of January. From that date, you put a nine month clock because you're not coming back earlier than nine months. It, it's just how ACL injuries work. But there's potential you could come back like at that nine month mark, which would be about Halloween with uh, the fact that he had to wait a month to get the surgery because of the torn MCL and all the swelling in the knee. I would guess that he, they're going to be more careful because the Vikings training staff has been more careful than they had been previously with Eric Sugarman. So I would guess that they're going to project forward and just be cautious. So you're going to need somebody to fill in. And is it necessarily the best? Is it going to be the best idea to bring in a, a tight end to be a starter? You could argue that it's not, but if you do Fant is a fantastic receiver, he's got blazing speed. I think he ran a four, five 40 at the combine five years ago, and he can run all those choice routes. He can run those seam routes. He's got good size. He's not going to be the greatest blocker in the world, but then again, neither was Hawkinson. And you have Josh Oliver for that true blocking tight end. Make Noah Fant that receiving tight end and give your quarterback who we don't know who it's going to be yet. We'll have some clarification, hopefully by Monday. And you'll give him the opportunity to have a tight end that can do multiple things. And the tight end is used heavily in this offense. TJ Hawkinson almost had a hundred receptions last year before he got hurt. So Fant could step into that role and find a way to maximize those choice routes, attack up the seams and make it so we don't miss Hawkinson much at all and really give him the time he needs to fully heal. And I know I, I see Mike in the comments saying, Oh, let Nick Muse play. I'm not saying that you shouldn't let Nick Muse play, 
But do you want Nick Muse as your starting pass catching tight end off the bat? That's the that's the question that the Vikings are going to have to a- ask themselves. And my guess is the answer is going to be no. Not because Muse is bad, not because he can't ever be something, but because what they ask Hawkinson to do is some high level stuff. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you for joining and becoming a member. We appreciate you. Yeah, but Fan I don't can think... do all that. Fan can I do mean... all that high level stuff. <sighs> He's not great at it. Well, you also have to remember, and I think this needs to be contextualized a little bit. He was brutally underutilized in that Seattle offense with, uh, and they just drafted Jackson Smith and Jigba. They have Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf. They didn't use him very much at all going vertically. And when they did, he showed that he could really attack vertically and do a lot of those things. Here's the thing with tight ends. It usually takes them four to five years to fully develop and really make an impact in the national football league. And Mateo mentions uh, Tyler Conklin. Conklin didn't really make an impact until his fourth year either. Like it's a normal curve for tight ends. Hawkinson didn't really truly break out until he got to the Vikings in year four. So I think fans best football is ahead of him. And if you can get him on a decent one year deal, Dalton Schultz last year signed like one year, 6 million. He just got a three year, $36 million extension from the Houston Texans. Maybe fans willing to go that route, because if you can prove it one more time in a pass heavy offense, like the Vikings have, then you can get bigger money. Mm -hmm. Well, unlike I've said a hundred times, you always draft the tight end for his next team. Maybe Mm -hmm. the Vikings are the next team for Noah Fant. Yeah. And I think it would just be a one year deal. I don't think you would sign him to a longer term deal unless your idea would be Fant and Hawkinson in 2025. And then you move on from the Josh Oliver contract, which isn't is a non-zero chance. If you, if you wanted to go that route, I would, I I would just look at a one year deal and try to maximize the one year and then see where things go from there because things may be great and you want to keep him. And that's awesome but you don't necessarily have to do that. But for right now, the Vikings are going to need a tight end to start for Hawkinson until he fully heals. And I think fan can be that guy. All right, Dave, before Bob, we move on, but Bob's hold on. Bob says we already did the Kirk thing. I must be a day behind. We, we have not fully discussed the whole Kirk cousins thing, mainly because Everybody is saying so many different things. It's there's a lot to keep up with. So we're, we're kind of not intentionally staying away, but attacking other areas where there may not be as much attention on those, which is why we're doing this huge free agency list, because I want you guys to see what kind of talent there is out there and who I really like to the Vikings to potentially bring in. Kirk is either going to stay or he's going to go. And I think he's gone. But we'll find out Monday is going to be huge when it comes to Kirk cousins, because that's when he's going to legally be allowed to talk to teams, not him, but his agent, even though let's be honest, his agents already talked to all those teams, but I would expect Kirk cousins to have an answer for us by the end of the day, Monday and be aware. The second we get any Kirk cousins official news, Dave and I are going live and we are going to be ready to rock and roll and get you all the news that you need for all the free agent signings. So be prepared for that. And before we move on, Dave, because we've got some interesting names in the last six, we should talk about our friends. Well, I'm about to say, Delton says he wants dogs. Speaking of dogs, let's talk about our friends at Underdog Rescue. We we adopted our sweetie Claire from Underdog, and tomorrow we are adopting a um, lab pity mix that we think also is Greyhound, and his name is Chet. We're going to call him Cheddar because I wanted to keep the food na- uh, theme with Eclair. We didn't name Eclair, but oh my goodness, what a perfect name for that sweet little girl. And we believe it's important to save rescues. And that is underdogs. Entire mission is to find the underdogs, the ones who weren't given the best opportunities, the ones who are at the puppy mills, the ones who were abandoned, the ones who are in overcrowded shelters from other States. They bring over here and they get them fosters and they get them adopted. They even take all all the dogs who have medical disabilities and try to give them the best lives. They are the true heroes, and we we want to help and support them, which is why my wife and I are adopting and temporarily fostering another dog next week. 
underdogrescuemn.com. Help them out by either adopting, fostering, or just a donation in any Claire's name. We would greatly appreciate it. Dave, we have some names to cover still. Okay. Next up, New York Giants running back, Saquon Barkley. Mm. This is going to elicit a lot of interesting reactions, and let's kind of break down what those reactions are. Oh, you don't pay running backs. Oh, running backs don't matter. Well, when you're about to have a rookie quarterback, having a good running game is paramount. Saquon Barkley is one of the best running backs in football. Sometimes to fix a problem, you have to overpay. And this is a robust running back market. Saquon, in my opinion, is the best of the bunch. Your mileage is going to vary with a guy like Josh Jacobs or Derrick Henry. I think Henry's a lot closer to wash. Saquon's 27. And he has missed a little bit of time outside of his torn ACL. He's missed nine other games over six seasons. But Saquon can thrive in his own scheme. He can thrive in a gap power scheme. He's great out of the backfield catching the football. And with that putrid offense that New York had last year with Tommy DeVito, a quarterback, and an offensive line that could not stay healthy one bit, Saquon had nearly 80% of his yards come after contact and nothing was easy for him. I don't necessarily love the idea of paying a running back big time money, but if you're going to, you do it with Saquon and you do it and you don't think twice because while the interior could be better, the reason the Vikings run game wasn't good was because of the running backs. It was because Madison couldn't maximize his vision because he didn't have any burst. He didn't have the ability to explode through the hole. And that's a problem. Ty Chandler couldn't hit the hole consistently well enough, even though he had the burst to get there. He was a little indecisive in his vision. And that's why I'm really big on bringing in Barkley. Jacobs would be okay. I think uh, he's actually going to go to the Chargers. That's my theory. Um, Eckler... I, I don't really believe he's got it anymore. And he's more of a, uh, a shotgun, like scat back kind of like, Hey, I'm going to catch the ball out of the backfield. We're going to do some RPO kind of stuff. That's where his game thrives. I don't think it's going to thrive in what Kevin O'Connell wants to do with the running game, which is why Saquon to me is so appealing because he can do that. He's already shown he can do that. And he's so multiple. You bring in Saquon, you've got a good change of pace back in Ty Chandler, a guy who you can give 10, 15 carries a game if you need to. Give Saquon 15 to 20. And personally, the reason why Kevin O'Connell kept straying away from the running game wasn't because he didn't want to run the ball. It was because he didn't trust his running backs. You bring in Saquon, that trust is there immediately. And it would be an expensive contract. PFF predicts three years, 36 million. There's a chance you get into bidding war. And you may have to give him an extra million or two in order to get that done. I think it'd be worth it considering you're going to bring in a rookie uh, quarterback and you can keep it on a three year deal. So it's not super, super like long term. So when he eventually does start to struggle, then you move on. But I would, f- there's not really a great running back class. I would fix it in free agency and Saquon would be my guy. Yeah, see, I think I think it's less about him being a running back focused coach. I just don't think he has running backs that he can trust. He inherited Dalvin Cook, who was washed. They tried to give Alexander Madison the job, and it didn't work. Cam Makers was starting to emerge, and then he tore his Achilles. I think it's just more about the personnel than it is about the coach. But once they get the personnel, and then if they start straying away from it, well, then we can have another conversation. But based on the information I have, I think it's just he doesn't trust his running backs. And I don't blame him. I don't blame him at all. All right. Yeah. Let's go back out to the West Coast, Dave. San Francisco 49ers defensive tackle Javon Kinlaw. Kinlaw is an interesting player. Dealt with some injuries with the 49ers and struggled struggled to really live up to the billing of being the 15th overall pick. Because if you recall, they traded DeForest Buckner to the Indianapolis Colts. And then they took Kinlaw basically as a one-to-one replacement because they had to worry about the salary cap. And they're like, okay, well we'll replace him. We, we know we're going to have a, we're going to have like 
uh, what, what's the word? We're going to have a regression at the position, but they use money to re-sign Eric Armstead. And now they have Javon Kinlaw, a promising rookie at the spot. Okay. Makes some sense. We'll see if it pans out. It didn't. Kinlaw uh, dealt with some injuries, but he was so dominant in college. And then at the senior bowl, he had two days of dominance and then he, he stopped. He just, he's like, Oh, I've proved everything I need to. Uh, I'm good. And nobody blamed him for it. Cause he was dominating literally everybody and everything. And once he got to the NFL, just struggled. He did play over 500 snaps for the first time this year. And I thought he played better. He still got some struggles, but this would be a, an inexpensive prove a contract. PFF has it at one year, $5 million. That's what Marcus Davenport is projected to get. DJ Owanum, I think is one year, 4.5. And with Kinlaw, I think there's a lot of positives to be able to extract from his game. Or at the very least, you have a rotational one tech, three tech, maybe even kick out to five tech on some downs and a player that can do a lot of good things. He just hasn't been consistent yet. Can you get more out of him? I don't know. But either way, $5 million for a fringe starter is not awful money, especially when you could get uh, like higher end starter output from him, just depending on uh, kind of looking at what his pedigree is, what his athletic ability is and his skill set. There's more you can extract. I just don't know if you'll be able to. That's why I think like a one-year $5 million deal makes a ton of sense. Also makes sense for Kinlaw because he gets a chance to go somewhere else and prove that he's worth that bigger contract, and then he can go cash in. But he's got the same disease sort of that Davenport has. Eh, he's he's had some minor injury issues, but he's also had some just some technique issues. Like the big thing with Davenport is before this year, he had never missed more than like four games in a season. It's not like he got hurt and missed like 15 games. It was just a minor ankle injury, a minor shoulder injury, that kind of stuff. Just dings. He just gets dinged up a little bit more. Well, Kinlaw, I think your biggest issue is the knee, but I also don't think it's like big enough. It's big enough where you're not giving him a big boy contract to really prove something. But when you're 5 million, if he only plays five games for you, it's a worthwhile risk and it's still a risk. Anybody who you're giving like a prove it deal to is a risk, but it's a calculated one that I think you can feel comfortable with. And I would like to have Kinlaw. If it works great. If it doesn't, I think you tried like you're not all these guys are going to hit. That's and at a certain point, it'll be like, okay, you're doing all these prove it deals. Why aren't they hitting? What's going on? What is your process that you keep missing? And we'll be able to have that conversation with Quasi Dolphimensa, but not yet. Let's move on, though, to another San Francisco 49er, another guy who could be on a prove it deal. Edge rusher Chase Young. And I know that some people will question his effort a little bit, and that is a very fair criticism. He had a, some plays where you just kind of took him off. I don't know if, like, based on when I watched his college tape, there were no effort lapses. So what's happened from then until now where you have some effort, la effort lapses on the field with the 49ers? Like, I, I don't know what that is, but I can tell you his stats from last season playing with both Washington and the 49ers, he had one game with 11 pressures. That's wild. Like, uh, Zadarius Smith had some of those where yeah, he, he had like 11 or 9 pressure games early on into... um the 2022 season young had a couple of those too. 74 pressures and 11 sacks across both teams. And he did help the 49ers make the super bowl. PFF has it at a one year, $15 million prove it deal. Look, here's the thing. You can dislike the fact that, Hey, he, he had some of those effort lapses. The talents insane. It was so good that in that 2020 draft, Washington said no to a quarterback and took young because they thought young was going to be this guy for a long time. And he still has all the talent in the world to be a guy for a long time. They passed on Tua and Justin Herbert for chase young. And you know what? Pretty much the entire football world agreed. They're like, this guy is going to be the next Bosa. He's so good. And he still has all that, that talent, but it's being able to extract it with consistency and get that consistent effort. 
those are big questions and why I don't think he'll end up getting a long-term deal. Why I think it's a prove it deal because he needs to prove to everybody else that he is this kind of performer and he can do it consistently. Will he ever be able to, I don't know, but if you lose Hunter, I think it's a risk worth taking. And if you don't think it's a risk worth taking, I completely understand. I get it. But the talent is insane. It's a, it's top five pass rusher kind of talent. Now I will say, I, I see people like saying that he just doesn't have the talent and shy town Vikings is like three years. And he's not that dude dog. He had a brutal torn ACL with um, other structural damage in middle of 2021. And it basically ruined his 2022 season. So he basically missed an, a year and a half because of a knee injury. 2023, he was fully healthy. 74 pressures, 11 sacks. So I, I would ne- not necessarily say that he doesn't have the talent. If you don't believe he has the effort, understand completely. But the talent's there. The talent is there. And I think a prove it deal might be your best bet. And if you still don't believe in what he is as like an effort guy, you don't have to sign him long-term and you can let somebody else do that after that prove it deal, but you have to find a pass rusher. And we'll talk about uh, another pass rusher or two later on that we can bring in, but hyper athlete, great size strength. You just got to be able to extract all of it. And we'll find out whoever signs him. We'll find out if they're going to be able to do that. My question, I'd like to be the team. Is he that one of those guys that was so good in college that he can, he thinks he can come in in the NFL and just out athletic people, and doesn't put in the time and the extra effort to get up to this level. From the outside looking in, I'm gonna say no. He did have nine sacks his rookie year, and then he got hurt his second year, like six games in, and it destroyed uh, both 2021 and 2022. And the commanders are like, you know what? we're not going to give you that fifth year option because of that injury. And we want to see you come back fully, which completely fair yet. These fifth year options are fully guaranteed. Now they are not injury only. So if the guy is not hurt, you can cut him and not have to worry about it. No, if you say yes, well, you're stuck in a fifth year option for an edge rushers. Buku bucks. We're talking like 15, 16, $17 million. So I don't think he's the kind of guy who just thinks I'm going to out athlete you because that's a real question. And we talked about it on the show, guys like Michael Vick Mm -hmm. who literally just tried to out athlete you. And he was so good. He could do it. I don't think young's that guy, but I also don't have all the information. So I can't be a hundred percent confident in that for my guess is no. I think when like he's on the backside of place, he just doesn't chase. And I think that's just a like, Hey, he, Hey, you know what? He took that playoff and can you live with that? Maybe can you coach it out? Maybe, but probably not. And you have to determine on a team by team basis, whether that's worth it for you. For me as a pass rusher. Yep. I'm in. I'd love to have him next to Daniel Hunter, but that's probably not going to happen. Like I think he's that good and he's still super young. He's like 25 years old. So maybe just a little bit of growth and maturity in the right locker room could help him extract some of that too. But we've got a couple more guys to get to including a couple edge rushers next up Cowboys edge rusher Doris Armstrong jr. And if you've never heard the name, I I can completely understand. He's been buried behind the likes of Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence's entire career. So the last three seasons, he's had the like 123 of his 143 pressures and 25 of his 27 sacks, only 1445 career pass rush reps across six seasons. And he has nine sacks in 2023 and 2022 as a rotational guy, a guy who's not playing starter kind of snaps. And I think this would be a perfect edge to somebody you can trust to be like, Hey, I just need you to get eight to 10 sacks a year. And I need you to play consistent football. I think this is the kind of guy you bring in for that. You don't bring him in to be your alpha. You don't bring him in to be your sack artist, but he's a great complimentary piece. Think of how DJ Wanham played last year. Like, I think he's a little better than DJ Wanham. He's a complimentary piece. And I think you can do a lot with a guy like Doris Armstrong Jr. Three years, 25.5 million. So eight and a half million dollars a year uh, predicted by PFF. 
there's a lot to like there and he can, he can do a little bit of everything. He's a, technically refined with, with some good athleticism. And I'll be honest, Mike, I don't know how well he plays against the run because he's been that situational guy. I think he's quality against the run. I, I would have to do a little bit more research, but you're bringing this guy mainly to be your pass rusher. And he's got that juice. Like you don't get nine sacks as the third guy with Demarcus Lawrence and Micah Parsons, unless you're pretty dang good at football. And some of that effectiveness is going to go down just a little bit, like the efficiency, because the more snaps you play, the less efficient you are just because as a general construct. So I think you may see a little bit of, Oh, he's not doing X, Y, or Z. He's not quite playing up to that same level. Well, you're asking him to do way more. So some of that efficiency metrics are going to go down and being asked to play the run significantly more. will we'll do that too. But I like him as a second option. I think that's a really good football player. All right. We've got two more guys to go. Let's go to a former just, first overall pick. What Dave? I just quickly looked up his grades. He's got uh, almost 70 overall defensive grade. His run defense is his weakness. It's just mm-hmm. below 60. But his pass rush is almost 70. That's, and and his tackling's above 70. So 60 is, with the PFF grading system, 60 is like average. average. So yeah. average run defender with that kind of uh, production as a sack artist? Yeah, I'm okay with that. And you know what? He might be able to be better against the run with more opportunities too. Like there's just so much unknown with a guy who's only been a rotational guy for six years that we need answers, but it's a risk worth taking as a second guy. Well, let's go to our 11th player, another edge rusher, former number one overall pick Baltimore edge rusher, Jadavian Clowney. Clowney had a fantastic year last year, 78 pressures, 11 sacks, 82.9 PFF grade. But what's really fascinating about Clowney, he's never become that sack artist people thought he could be coming out of college. He's always been a great run defender. He's always been solid against the run and more of a a disruptor than a finisher as a pass rusher. So he's more of a power guy. He's going to utilize that speed to power and just drive offensive linemen back into the pocket and be able to get to the quarterback. He's a hyper athlete, so he can do a little bit of that chase element too. Jadavian Clowney is a very good football player. And I am a, I am a fan. Uh, PFF has him at a one year, $9 million evaluation. I think that's pretty fair. I think when you have a conversation about your edge rushers, having complimentary pieces is just as important as having that alpha. It'd be great if Daniel Hunter was still here and you brought in a guy like Clowney to be opposite him. But I don't think you want Clowney to be your number one. But you get you give me 78 pressures and eight, 11 sacks on the other side. That's pretty good, especially when you consider how good he is in run defense. Like, that's worth $9 million to me. That's probably worth $15 million. Problem is, he's 31 right now. Yeah, and the, a one-year deal is just fine. But he's had, he's finally coming around as a really consistent pass rusher. You take a look at some of the splits. He's having his, his best production years, the last couple. And I'm not saying that he's a long-term solution. I'm not saying he's, he's a guy that you want to lock up long-term on a one or two year deal before like that. Some of that athleticism and he starts to come out of his prime and it starts to wane. I think Clowney's a really solid option, especially because like Hunter, we still have no idea. He's, we just know he's going to chase the bag. And is the bag going to be here? I'm going to be honest. I don't, I don't think it is. But that's, that's a decision that we're going to have to probably live with. And with Hunter now going into year 10 and about to be 30, it might be smart to not pay him. I still would because of what Hunter is as a pass rusher. He doesn't rely on athleticism. He relies on technique more than anything. And when you rely on technique that that will help extend your career, but we'll kind of see, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening. And like I've said, people said, 
when it comes to edge rushers, edge rushers last longer. It's usually about to 33. Heck, mm-hmm. uh, Von Miller even got, he had a contract readjust today, but he's still playing. And Von Miller seems to have been playing for the last two decades. So he, he was the happen. second overall pick in 2011. And I believe now he's 34 years old. And when he signed that six year, $120 million contract, it was basically three years, 57 and the back end was just kind of flop. So I think he's, he's wearing down and it's really sad because that torn ACL he suffered in, on Thanksgiving against the lions two years ago, really crushed the end of his career because he was playing some really, really good football. Vaughn Miller's 35. <clears throat> oh, he just is 35 turned, already. Okay. Turned 35 last month. Yeah. Um, Anthony asked if we're paying Clowney 10 million for one year, why not resign Wanham for two years of 10? Because I think Wanham's getting significantly more than two years, 10 million. And I don't want to pay Wanham that kind of money. If it's two years, 10 million, I'll take it. But I don't think he's, I think he's going to sign for more. That's just my lean on it. All right. Last guy. Panthers inside linebacker, Frankie Louvu. Frankie Louvu has been a favorite of like the film grinders in the industry. They just love his game. And he is going into year seven. He didn't really get significant playing time until 2021 with the Panthers. But once he did, he started thriving. PFF grades of 84.8, 74.8, and 80.0. And the interesting thing about him from a Vikings perspective, seven sacks each of the past two seasons. He's not just a really good pass rusher as an off ball linebacker. He can play in coverage. He can play run defense. He can do a little bit of everything. And because he can do a little bit of everything that is incredibly valuable to a guy like Brian Flores. I don't know what he'll end up commanding. PFF is projecting three years, 30 million, which I think is a very fair deal for a guy who can be multiple as a second level defender. I like the idea of bringing in some good linebackers to fortify. So then you can have Asamoa and Ivan Pace Jr. as rotational guys and not have to rely on them as starters. Like second level defenders are going to be more impactful now, as I mentioned earlier, than they have been in a long time because of how the game has shifted and a lot of teams playing too high safeties and you have to really control the middle of the field. Great linebackers can do that. So, Luvu is an interesting guy, and especially because of that versatility and that pass rush ability, you can do a lot with him. And that's the list. That is all 12. And I think if the Vikings can end up with two or three of these guys, I think it would be a really successful offseason. The Vikings aren't going to end up with all of these guys. They may end up with zero. We'll kind of see how things end up turning out. But these are the guys that I would want them to talk about bringing in talk to them, see if you can work out a deal, see if you can try to make multiple of these happen because there is a lot of talent out there and you need to fortify, not just for this year, but for the future. And depending on how your draft picks end up shaping up, the like the development of a guy like Patrick Jones, the second, Andre Carter, the second, an edge rusher, do you feel comfortable enough where you could do like a, like a couple one, two-year deals and then trust those guys to really fill in later on? These are the kind of team building questions that Quasi Dolphins and the staff are going to be talking about, and they've been talking about all off season. So, this is kind of how I would approach it: try and bring in as many talented players as you can, and if you can do that, that's going to make a really big impact on the team in twenty twenty four and beyond. George asks cornerbacks: Was there any free agent cornerbacks? And I just saw something hit the. Tweeter about uh, the Chiefs cornerback, whether they're offering him for trade or something. Yeah, they're offering him for trade. I'm not trading for him. I'm um, I'm not. I think Snead's really, really good. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to give up a second or first round pick to get him, and then you have to pay him market value. I don't, I don't necessarily think there's a ton of awesome corners on the market. I think there's a couple of guys that provide some intrigue uh, when you talk about, hey, this guy could help fortify my room, but there's not an alpha. JC Jackson, I would completely stay away from. He's fallen off massively the last two years after a really good start to his career. Stefan Gilmore is an interesting player, but he's 34 years old. That might be like a two-year kind of stopgap, but he played really well for the Cowboys last year, especially in man coverage. Kenny Moore from the Colts is 29, but he's more of a slot-only guy. Shadobi Awuzie, 29 as well. 
like there's not a ton of depth in this cornerback market. It's I think you bring in a guy who's a fringe starter, maybe a Jeff Okuda or a CJ Henderson and let them fight for a starting job. Let them fight for playing time and help kind of the room can grow because there's more competition. Um, Tredavious White's interesting. The talent's there. He's played 10 games last two years. He's been hurt, 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 hurt. Like, I would kind of stay away. Like, we'll kind of see what ends up uh, shaping up with this, uh, with this franchise and how they want to attack the cornerback room. But I wouldn't try and go get an alpha. I think you've got some good football players. I would focus on the front seven. If you fix the front seven, it's going to make the secondary's lives a lot easier. And the secondary didn't play bad last year. We have to remember that. They weren't great, but they weren't bad. A Caleb Evans, until like the last few games, where yeah, it looked like something was just way off, and I think some of that might have been injury, played pretty well the first 10 games. Byron Murphy Jr. tore his MCL, essentially, against the Bengals, played with it, and then missed the last three games. He played really well, too. So how much do you want to invest in a corner when you already have cornerbacks playing well? I would fortify the room and get these guys in a better position to succeed and bring in competition. But I don't think you need to bring in that, that cornerback one. If you do, I think like I get it. I think it's a, an interesting idea. I think there's a lot of merit to it, but I don't think you have to do that. I don't think you have to do that at all. So that, that's kind of how I see corner. Um, there's a lot of different options for this team and I'm going to be fascinated to kind of see what directions they end up going because there are a lot of options for this team. Yep. And, sounds great. Yeah. And with that, that is our show. We'll have one more skull search by the end of the week. Dave and I are going to f- figure that out because tomorrow we're getting the new doggy and we are very excited to have him. We just got his uh, crate and his bed all set up and ready to go. And we are going to be really excited for that. Um, and don't forget two old bloggers on Sunday with our final free agency preview notes before legal tampering starts on Monday. You're going to want to subscribe and ring the bell because we're going to be going live a lot. We're going to be having short conversations about all these free agency moves. Um, the potential of Daniel Hunter leaving the potential of Kirk cousins leaving or both of them staying. You're not going to want to miss any of it. And What's really cool is next Wednesday, the 13th is our one year anniversary. We started this channel one year ago, next Wednesday. So we'll have some kind of woo woo celebration as we talk about free agency (laughs) on next week's the real forno show until then we'll be celebrating. I would love to be celebrating being, being in the top three. Any way you wish. Yeah. Uh, From Dave, I'm Tyler. Thanks for watching and skull Vikings, everybody. Skull Vikings. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching. The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!